As you're being seated, if you would open up your Bibles or the Pew Bibles to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll get into 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 today. I venture to say, if you missed last week, you did it purposely, didn't you, huh? You knew the content of last week was human sexuality, and I'm here to remind you today that if you missed last week because we covered human sexuality, you counted wrong because it's a two-part sermon series. And so today, once again, is the closure of the sermon sequel from 1 Corinthians on human sexuality in mind. I will give you the same disclaimer that we threw out last week, right? And, and that is that, that if, if you miscalculated the weeks and didn't think this was the content, this is the time to pretend like the bladder is filled and it's time to use the restroom. I, I told the first service they could pretend that they just got paged that their kid in Wiggly Worship was acting up and they have to go back there. We don't even have a pager system for that, but they could pretend just, just to get out of the sanctuary. And so you may use that moment right now if, if that is that miscalculation and you weren't expecting to hear about sex in church this morning. I will say, if you remain in your seat, though, this next 20 seconds there, that, that you need to remain in it for the full duration of the sermon. And because that is that there is good news for all. There really is. And we're getting to the good news, but sometimes we have to hear the bad news before we realize how just great that good news is of Jesus. We've got to call sin a sin so that we can see the Savior that came for the sins of the world, Okay. And so we're getting there, but we have to deal with some bad news en route to the good news with that at hand. And so stick in here for the full duration, if that's you. Just remind you, summarize what we did last week. We began last week by comparing the human sexuality to to really this book, the the user manual for life. And that is that that a, a manufacturer will put forth a user manual about how best to use the product. If you want the product to go for good, you'll use the product in this way. If you want the product to break down and to be destroyed, you'll use it in this way. And so a manufacturer will put out a user manual to help guide us about how to use the product. Well, this is the user manual for life. The Bible that God had given us and God created life, including all aspects of life, including our sexuality in life. God is the creator of all that. And so he's given us some guidelines some user manual specifications about how do we relate in this area of sexuality to use it for our benefit and and, and health and not to our detriment and breakdown in that way. And so we looked at the Bible last week to discover God's parameters in life, and we even illustrated it in this way of a fire, right? A fire is is a good gift. Like you can heat your food up on it, right? You You can warm alongside it. Fire is good, when left in the proper boundaries of life of a fireplace or a fire pit. You can cook on it, you can warm up by it, it's a good thing. But if fire is outside those intended boundaries, right? If it jumps out of the fireplace and onto the sofa, and all of a sudden engulfs the sofa in the duration of the house, all of a sudden this good gift of fire is turned harmful and detrimental and, and, and can lead to the breakdown of a home in a real way. And that's a, that's a parable in some ways of sexuality. Sexuality kept in its proper confines really is a good God-given gift to be enjoyed in life. But outside of those boundaries, it can be harmful. It can lead to the breakdown of homes and to human relationships in that way. And so God, in His goodness, has given us some guidelines about how best to use this area of human sexuality that will lead to our health and flourishing rather than to harm and being burnt in the long run of things. And so we covered some of those things last week, and and as it relates there, looking at Genesis 1 and 2 of of the blueprints of marriage, the parameters of human sexuality between a male and a female in the marriage context there is the good God-given parameters for pleasure, for procreation. And then we chase the rabbit of homosexuality as it came up in the text of Corinthians, as it comes up in our culture today, as it comes up in our denominational debate today, as we talked at length about last week with that, what the Bible does say and doesn't say in regards to human and homosexuality. And so we covered all that last week. I will reference you to to the internet and the church webpage to access that. We want to continue our discussion with human sexuality in mind for the newer content that he's going to share to us through Corinthians. And so to do that, I want to invite you to turn once again, 1 Corinthians 6. We'll pick up in verse number 9 and we'll read through to, to chapter 7 where our content will be today. It's found on page 994 in your pew Bible. And before we get there, let's just pause for a little word of a prayer. 
Dear Lord, it's, it's delicate issues. And as we said for the first service, we'll repeat again today, we're working against a lot, Lord. There's been a time change. There's this delicate, intimate area of sexuality. There's so much that is wrapped up into this, Lord, that we're just praying that you would help us sort through what needs sorted through, that your spirit would have its work in our life, and that you would even give me the words to say it and to say it truly and to say it with the care that it needs to be said in. And so help us all with that today, we ask and pray. In Jesus' name. And as people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pick up in verse number 9 of chapter 6, 994. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor sexual perverts, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. It was the passage we really camped down in last week, right? The reminder of who the Corinthian church was made up of and yet what God was able to do, whatever the sin was that was listed. Paul didn't mince words, right? He, he called a sin a sin, but said there's a Savior for that. And as Paul began his letter, right, talking about the cross, talking about Jesus in chapter 1, then segueing in chapter 2 and chapter 3 to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit, he now applies those theological, theological matters to the everyday sexuality or sin issues that was plaguing the Corinthian church. Did you, did you catch how he ended that in verse 11? You, you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in, uh, in the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit in Jesus' work on those issues at hand, he applies that to those life and those scenarios. He goes on to unpack a theology of sexuality in this next paragraph. Verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. I don't think we talked on this last week, right? We, we ended, the, the services stopped at different points last week in that kind of way, and so that's why I was asking the refresher there. Paul is saying in this, this section, this paragraph to come, he's, he's going to unpack a little theology of sexuality, and it begins by unpacking some common cultural sayings or Corinthian sayings. Scholars will debate, is this the culture's talk? Is this the Corinthians' church? I think it's probably a both hand. But you'll notice those italicized questions in verse 12 and verse 13, right? A common saying in the pop culture of Corinth or the Corinthian church, all things are lawful for me. What are they saying? I can do what I want. It's, it's my rights here that we're talking about. As long as I'm not harming anyone else, just let me be me. That's the word that the, call, the Corinthians were tossing out. That's not unfamiliar with maybe many of the discussions in sexuality today. All things are lawful for me. It, it's okay for me to do this. And Paul's reminding them but not all things are helpful. Some things that are right aren't necessarily good, aren't necessarily for your gain in the long run of things. You, you might have your rights to do that, but it might not be for your best long term to do that, is what Paul is reminding them. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Sometimes when we give something permission into our life, we then become its puppet. We then become its master. Maybe it starts small in that way, but then we become enslaved by it. Maybe pornography is maybe the most telling of those, huh? You, 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 you do a little click here, there, and all of a sudden, uh, this click leads to that click, that leads to that click, that leads to that click. No one's getting hurt by it, right? It's just a screen in that kind of way, and yet Paul's saying you're becoming a slave to it. It's your master in that way, and so there's a misuse of sexuality. In the third argument, verse 13, Food's meant for the stomach, not stomach for the food. It's the argument that this is just biology that we're talking about, right? It's just a hunger. It's just an appetite. It's just an urge. And so I've got this hunger. I've got this appetite. I've got this urge for food. And, and I've got a stomach for food. And so it makes sense. Eat what you got a, a, a part for, right? The stomach's for food. I've got a hunger for food. It's just fitting that I eat food. And so the same is with sexuality, right? I've got an urge for sexuality. I, I've got some body parts to be sexualized with. And so it makes sense. Just do what's biology, right? And Paul's going to say there's going to be something different about eating than sexing. The two aren't synonymous. And, and I think we know that truly at a heart level, right? M many of us could say the circumstances that led to the first sexual encounter. 
whether that was a wanted sexual encounter or an unwanted sexual encounter. Many of us could tell you who it was with there, where it was at, and these different details. Can you tell me that same thing about your first cheeseburger? Like, we realize there's some differences here in, in this sexual appetite. Though both have a hint of biology, there's something more than just biology that's taking place in sexuality that wouldn't be the same for food. And so Paul's going to unpack that a little bit further for the Corinthians. It's not just a stomach-to-food, one-to-one correspondence here. He's going to say halfway in through verse, verse 13, The body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise up by his power. He, he's pointing to the resurrection and, and that these bodies matter there. We, these bodies matter. And part of Paul's argument for that is that Jesus was raised bodily, right? We don't believe in just the resurrection of spirits. We believe in the resurrection of the bodies. And if God is going to resurrect these bodies, then what we do in these bodies matters. That doesn't mean that there's not some sort of transformation and some healing and all of that that gets shaken down into the resurrection. We certainly affirm that. But it is to say that, that these bodies and what these bodies perform, it, it, it does matter in the grand scope of eternity if we truly believe that Jesus was raised from the dead bodily, which Paul is going to unpack in chapter 15. The longest chapter in the New Testament is on the bodily resurrection of Jesus. We're getting there. Don't worry. We're, 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 we're heading there. Just not today. Just not today. I promise. Just not to, today. Some of you aren't believing me in that. Let's, let's keep going. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I therefore take the member of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who joins himself to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun immorality. Every other sin which a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. Part of Paul's argument there is that we, through faith in Jesus, are being united to Jesus. And so what we're united to in the sex act there, which he's citing Genesis 1, the two will become one flesh, Genesis 1 and 2 on that matter. What, what we become united to sexually has to be done in surrender to who we are united to spiritually. It matters who we're going into bed with if, if Jesus is our Lord if he's made a prescription on, on what is the proper boundaries of sexuality in that kind of way. And so part of the theology of sex is that you have to have a theology of who your Savior is, who the Lord of your life is, and, and what that's propelling you to in your life in that way. I pulled down a heart. I probably thought otherwise of this, but in the first service there, I started tearing this heart apart there to help illustrate. I did do that for this service too. I'm seeing some head nods maybe in that, in that direction there. It's, it's the reminder, the visual, that you give a part of yourself to, to who you experience with sexually. And so it was used in a youth group I know growing up that, 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 that we were in, that a, a piece was torn and just given as a physical illustration that what we are doing in the sex act is truly giving a part of ourselves. It's not just meeting an urge. It's not just meeting a need. We are uniting ourselves with someone else to this act by giving a part of ourselves to whoever that may be. And so Paul's unparking that in, in part of this. We've given ourselves to Christ. And so be mindful of who we are then tearing that heart of Christ to who we're giving it to. He's given it to us a whole heart to share with someone in the context of marriage not to just share and scatter about as a half-hearted people in all these other relationships with that in mind. He's going to kind of change from the theology of sexuality to deal with some specific question and answer responses in chapter 7 that follows. And so we want to turn our attention there at this time. Seven, Chapter 7, verse number 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote. You, you see, this is where he's responding to which what was written his direction. And actually from chapter 7 onwards, he's going to be responding to different issues that the Corinthians wrote to him concerning. And so chapters 8 through 10 is going to be about some social arrangements. Who do I talk with? What, what outings do I go to as a believer in Christ in that way? He's going to address that in chapters 8 through 10. He's going to deal with the topic of worship in the church. 
What is the liturgy there? What, what, is, what, what takes place in a church setting in Corinth? He's going to write to those specific issues in all the chapters that follow. This first one has to do with marriage and sexuality and celibacy. And so he's going to write concerning all those matters. Now concerning the matters which I wrote, or which you wrote to me about, rather. It is well for a man not to touch a woman, but because of the temptation to immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. They're writing, should should, should we be celibate for Christ in that way or should we engage in sexuality? And Paul is going to say a both and throughout all of this. There's two proper bounds for human sexuality according to a Christian ethic. That's in singleness, celibacy. In marriage, sexuality between a male and a female. And so he's going to keep referencing that in all these scenarios that follow, but he's beginning with that in those first two verses. Verse 3, dealing with the married, he says this, "...to the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not rule over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not rule over his own body, but the wife does." If you're throwing elbows to this, it should have been thrown both ways, okay? Because he's showing through a marriage relationship, it's a both and, right? A giving and receiving. Not one party doing all the giving or one party doing all the receiving in regards to sexuality and every other matter, right? Remember the paradigm we're given in Eden? Adam and Eve? Eve was created out of Adam's what? Rib? Why the rib? Because they were to go through life side by side together, rib by rib. This wasn't one over the other and domineering the other. It was a side-by-side. And Paul's getting back to that and even the way it plays out in our sexuality. There's a give and there's a take side-by-side together between husband and wife when marriage is working according to the blueprints of God's design for marriage, including in regards for sexuality. Verse number five. Don't refuse one another except perhaps by agreement for a season so that you may devote yourselves to prayer but then come together again, lest Satan tempt you through lack of self-control. I say this by way of concession, not of command. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own special gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. I I think verse 7 might be a key to unlocking some of Paul's arguments on all this. What has God called you to be and to live into that in that kind of a way? We'll, we'll get into more of that a little bit later on, but just, just be mindful of that. Verse number eight. To the unmarried and widows. First he dealt with married couples, now he's going to unmarried and widows category. I say that it is well for them to remain single as I do, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. You get the impression Paul's single. I don't know why he was single. I don't know if his spouse had died. I don't know if there was a divorce in the equation. Or I don't know if he was single all through life. I just don't know that geographical, biological detail of Paul's life. But he's single, and he's encouraging singleness, not as a second-race status in the life of believers and in his devotion with God. And yet there is a proper sexuality in marriage. He's walking that both-hand line, isn't he? Of singleness and abstinence and sexuality within the context of, of a marriage bed and he does that even in verse 8 through 9 he's going to say in verse 10 to the married i give this charge not i but the lord that the wife should not separate from her husband but if she does let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband and the husband should not divorce his wife it's the problem when you read the bible right it brings up some touchy subjects Last week, we had to chase a rabbit as it pertained to homosexuality as it came up in verse number 9 of homosexuality. And this week, we have to chase the rabbit of divorce for a moment. And what does the Bible say and not say about divorce? I love my job, but some weeks I hate it. (laughs) I'm just being truthful with you. And and these are the topics the past two weeks that, that, that don't make me feel comfortable and don't leave you feeling comfortable in that hand. But we need to hear what does the user product manual say of an all-loving and all-knowing God that genuinely knows what's best and has commanded what's best in his love and care and concern for you. And God does touch on the topic of divorce. And it should probably not surprise us, right? If, if we're upholding the value of marriage, then yes, God does value marriage. Divorce is not the ideal. Divorce is not the ideal in God's word and, and encouraged by God's church. It's, it's not. God would say it this way in in Malachi 2, for I hate divorce. 
says the Lord, the God of Israel. Notice what he doesn't say too, okay? He doesn't say, I hate divorced people. Sometimes we read that and we rush to that, right? God does not hate divorced people. He hates the thing of divorce itself. Because God realizes even maybe more intricately than we realize, and that is the tearing apart that divorce does. I I had the imagery, it didn't work in the first service, but just pretend in your mind's eye of two pieces of paper glued together, right? There's a uniting in marriage, something deeper than Elmer's glue that's going on in marriage, right? The Bible says two become one. And so whenever two pieces of paper become one through glue, it's not easy to separate. And often when you do separate, right, what happens? You got a little piece of this paper left with that paper and a little piece left with that paper because it's not an easy break in that kind of way. And and that's the imagery of, of divorce in mind. It's not God's ideal for the life. And yet with that said too, God doesn't say that divorces are never applicable. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there are circumstances that warrant a divorce. And so I know sometimes we cloudy the waters, right? When we talk about the, the, the issue of homosexuality, we, we lump then divorce together and we say, why aren't we treating divorced people the same way as we're treating homosexuals? And the reason for that is, is the Bible doesn't deal with them exactly the same. They're not apples to apples. It's, it's apples to oranges, right? Both might be fruit. Both might deal with sexuality in some way, shape, or form, but they are two totally different categories with that in mind in the old testament and in the new testament the issue of homosexuality is never supported it's always called a sin and yet matters of divorce under certain circumstances is not always called a sin as a matter of fact it's called god's not plan a but but that it's needed in some way shape or form i say all of this okay i say all of this and maybe it mucks up some dirt that we would rather just be let settled in that kind of way. And I hear that, I understand that. Hear me today, though. God does not give human life a rewind button. There's no do-overs. We can't go backwards and undo what's done. We've got what we've got today, and this is where we're at, and this is the state we're in. Okay? There's no rewind button. But what you need to hear is there is a redemption button. Did you hear that? No rewind button, but there is a redemption button. And that means this. God doesn't, when he comes to, to, to change our life, he doesn't take us back in life to undo what's been done. What he does is he leads us forward from the point we're at now. He forgives and frees us to live differently, okay? And so this is not a quest to, to heap up more shame and to make you want to go backwards. And don't hear that. It's that God is going to take us where we are and he's leading us forward in the state where he finds us today, Okay? And so look at his face today and follow and be faithful to him today. Jesus does speak on divorce and does give some scenarios where divorce is the permittable option. He even cites Moses. Back in Deuteronomy 24, there's a certificate of divorce that God is instructing his people in some circumstances where where this is the viable option. He cites him. He says, Moses permitted divorce as a concession to hard hearts. It was not what God had originally intended, a.k.a. this is not God's ideal, And yet sometimes he makes a plan out of what was not his A plan in that way. Verse 9, I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. And Paul's even going to add some further scenarios because part of unfaithfulness there is an abuse of a body, right? If, if, if someone, someone will ask the question there, is abuse correct? If, if we see someone walking down the street that just keeps punching their face and they're bloodied or bruised, messed in that kind of way, we get that person help, right? If they're abusing and attacking their body in this kind of way, they need some help in that way from themselves. And in some way, that's the picture of marriage when we're abusing a spouse, The Bible says two become one, and so if you're abusing your spouse, you're attacking, you're abusing, you're hitting your own body. And that's not mentally stable or right in any which way of the way that God has designed marriage. And so there's a place to to get out and to seek help and need separation in in, in that kind of a context, which Paul is going to write at and what he says following this. And so we need to hear those words. Divorce, is, it, it, divorce not being ideal is not to say that God is saying if you're being abused in some way, you stay in that situation and just put up and grin with it. No, there are circumstances where even though divorce is not the ideal, it is the best for that circumstance and scenario. 
It's never a, an always all one size fits the boat. Do, do you hear that and understand the differences and nuances in this charged, intimate area of, of human sexuality as it relates to divorce? I'm not getting any feedback in that kind of way. And so I will just trust it's setting in. And if you'd like further dialogue on that, as always, please, following the service, we can dialogue in those kind of ways. He's going to deal with some more issues of divorce in chap- verse number 12 and following. He says this. To the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is consecrated through the wife and the unbelieving wife is consecrated through the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they're holy. But if an unbelieving partner desires to separate, let it be so. In such case, the brother or sister is not bound. You see in some other circumstances where divorce might be the round? The, there, there's something happening in the church of Corinth, and that is that people are coming to the faith. That they're becoming followers of Jesus, and not always is the, is the spouse following suit. And it's creating friction at home. One spouse is a believer, another spouse is an unbeliever, and now there is conflict over this matter of faith. And Paul's writing to address that specific scenario. Sometimes the unbelieving spouse wants out. And sometimes the unbelieving spouse still wants to fight for their marriage. And what's Paul prescribing? If the unbelieving spouse wants out, then, then you've got to let them out. If the unbelieving spouse wants out, number, verse number 15, or v- verse 15, but if the unbelieving partner desires to be separated, let it be so. In such a case, the brother or sister is not bound. If the spouse wants to remain in, verse 12 and following, then remain in. God might be using this scenario to, to start planting some seed works of faith in a genuine, sincere, gracious way, not trying to pound one spouse over the other with this is where I'm at spiritually, you should be here too. No, not not being, no one's nagged into the kingdom that way, right? But a genuine witness right next door can be a powerful witness in the lives of believers that Paul is writing to. Verse, Verse 16. Wife, how do you know whether you will save your husband? And husband, how do you know whether you will save your wife? Verse 17, only let everyone lead the life which the Lord has assigned to him and which God has called him. This is the rule in all the churches. Was anyone at at the time the called already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandment of God. Everyone should remain in the state in which he was called. Were you a slave when you were called? Never mind. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a slave is a free man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, brethren, in whatever state each was called, let him remain with God. Now concerning the unmarried. I have no command of the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who is the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it's well for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek marriage. If you marry, you do not sin. And if a girl marries, she does not sin. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you of that. I mean, brethren, that the appointed time has grown very short, From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the form of this world is passing away. Paul's inscription, Paul's principle is always to live life on earth in light of eternity, okay? in singleness or marriage, to remember who you're betrothed to for all of eternity. And in faith in Christ, that's Jesus, okay? Whether we are singled or married, the one that we're going to be married to for all eternity is Jesus, not your spouse or not your singleness. And so Paul is constantly putting in that perspective to earthly marriages and living in light of eternity and living in light of who Jesus is and how that relates to everyday life. He's going to close in much the same way that way. Verse 32 and following. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord and how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs and how to please his wife and his interests are divided. 
An unmarried woman or girl is anxious about the affairs of the Lord and how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let him marry, it's no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So that he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If the husband dies, she's free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I have the Spirit of God. It's the Word of God. It's the story of our lives. And specifically, this area of the story of our lives is Paul addressing specific issues. Questions the Corinthians have written to Paul that he's addressing with a Christian ethic in regards to human sexuality and marriage and all these other matters of human life in that way. And so it's with that in mind, I just want to outline four different things that I think we can glean from these last two weeks on sexuality. In this section, specifically chapter 5 and following, where Paul's addressing some sexual, some marriage, some single matters with his congregation in Corinth in this way. So let me just suggest four things. The first thing that I've learned in summarizing sexuality through the study of Corinthians is that there is a place to say sex at church. Like, like think of this. Paul opens his letter with the cross and talking about Jesus. You'd expect that at church, right? And then, then Paul goes in chapters 2 and 3 to talk about the Holy Spirit. We're Trinitarian, right? We believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, we would expect that kind of discussion in church, Amen. Paul then discusses some conflict and authority issues that he had at church in the very next chapter, and you're dealing with people, right? Conflict is going to creep in, and so you might expect there to be some conflict in Corinth. Once again, an expected matter to talk about at church. But then you know what he does for the next three chapters? He says sex at church. First, he deals with a, a man sleeping with his stepmom in that scenario and what it's creating in the congregation. Then he unpacks a theology of sex in chapter 6. And then he talks about some specific sexual issues or singleness issues in that lengthy chapter that we just did. Paul says sex at church in Corinth because it's a sex-saturated culture, right? Right outside the city is a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, where there's over a thousand prostitutes connected to that temple worship. And so sex is in the headlines of Corinth. But this is what gets me too. Paul doesn't just say sex at Corinth. In, in many of the letters in the New Testament where Paul is writing to churches he helped plant, he's dealing with the issue of sexuality, either the immorality of it or trying to guide them into what is the Christian blueprints for sexual de design there. It's all over the New Testament, which says all over where Paul planted churches, he's dealing with this intimate area of sexuality in the church setting. He says sex at church. And, and the reason why we've dealt with sexuality in church is because even if we don't deal with it at church, it's out there, right? The main reason why we covered this is, is because it's in the text itself, but also particularly with that 30, 40, 50, 60 wiggly worshipers that we have on a Sunday morning. Did you know the average age that a child is exposed to sexuality is by age 11 on a computer screen or a phone screen where they're searching for something and up pops, if you type in one letter wrong in some cases, a pornographic image that is degrading and detrimental image of sexuality, right? Often when a sexual image pops up on a computer screen or on a TV or on a movie in that kind of way, it's not sexuality to the fullness that God designed it, right? It's just fi filling urges there in oftentimes a downgrading way, a demeaning way to one part or the other in that way that's, that's less than humanitizing. And by age 11, Today, kids are being exposed to that. I've seen some studies that kick that number down to age eight as the first image, by and large, where kids have a sexual encounter image on the screen. That concerns me as a parent. Eight years old is second grade. I've got a second grader. You hear me? 
And that's what the reality of parents are raising in this way. That, that's why the church needs to speak to this issue of sexuality. Because Hollywood's speaking about it. Their computer screens, their phone screens, they're speaking about it, right? And so those voices are already there, including their peers. And usually those voices aren't saying the proper bounds that's going to lead to health and wholeness and a higher view of the beauty of this sex act. Usually on those other screens, it's degrading and enslaving and not helpful for the long run. So the church needs to speak about these issues if we're going to get God's perspective on how he designed it for health and wholeness in the building up and bonding of partners, not the downgrading and demeaning of certain aspects of society. You hear that? We need to deal with tough issues, even in the church, as tough as it may be. And Paul is doing that repeatedly in the churches he's planting. Second thing I think we can learn summarizing this, the, the sexual content that we've read in 1 Corinthians. I don't know how to word this one, okay? So you might need to change the wording based on the point in this way. But, but what I'm trying to say is the Christian view of sex is different than society's, and that's not a bad thing. Like, we should expect the church to have a different sexual framework than broader society at hand. And maybe this point really comes out of the question and answer time last Sunday after, we, we, we said after the service last Sunday that we would have a question and answer time about the, the, the sermon content in the evening in the Wesley room and a handful of people had showed up just to talk real life matters and how does a Christian engage these scenarios. One of those scenarios that was brought up is not an uncommon scenario. I've heard it many a different times in many a different settings in this way and that is how do I deal with, with a homosexual co-worker? From a Christian standpoint, how do I deal with a homosexual co-worker? Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's just a co-worker. You, you fill in the gap but this is a common question in that way. And, and how I addressed it in that setting there, I figured it needs to be addressed in this way with all of us. It also came up in a small group. One of our, our, our small groups dealt with this same scenario as well. And this is the prescription that I gave there. In chapter 5, so it was two weeks ago, text that we covered, Paul is going to write saying this to the Corinthian church. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral men, not at all meaning the immoral of this world or greedy, or robbers, or adulterers, since you would need to go out of this world. No, but rather, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister and is guilty of immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, or reviler, drunkard, or robber, not even to eat with such as one. For what I have to do with judging outsiders, it's not, is it not those inside whom you're to judge? God judges those outside. Drive the wicked person from among you. With, with that verse is the principle there. What, what I said in this question and answer dialogue is, is that how do we deal with a, a co-worker who might be homosexual or a family member that is homosexual? My advice was be their friend. Be their family member. Be in relationship with this person. Which means this, you talk sports with them. You talk weather with them. You talk how's work going with you. What did you do this weekend? And what gives you the greatest joy and what gives you the greatest pain? You, you talk matters of life with them. You live in relationship with them. Why? Because it's in this relationship with them that as we share our real joys and our real concerns, that, that Christ might be doing something in this work. Paul is encouraging the Corinthians there. As you're dealing with the moral people, I wrote with you in my letter in Immoral Men, not at all meaning immoral of this world or the greedy, the robbers, the idolaters, since you would need to go out of this world. No, talk with them. Be in relationship with them. Be genuine, be truthful, be loving. Enter into that relationship because it's in that space that God is going to do something in your life and in their life as you're living in relationship. But where Paul is drawing the line is we shouldn't have this issue inside the church. We shouldn't have this issue inside the church. And that's where I guess my heart hurts in, in the present debate of human sexuality that we have in the church. Because I genuinely believe that, that, that the Supreme Court, they can decide something differently, and that's fine. The, the broader culture, they can have some views on sexuality that I don't hear. But, but where I don't understand in the debate is, is when God has already spoken to it, anything that we do then is a redefinition of what God has already said. And God has already said something in regards to human sexuality. And so if we are redefining what God said, that, that puts us on a scary slope of saying, God, your words were wrong. 
in some way, shape, or form. And so I don't think the debate should be had in the church where God has already taken a stance on, on what the definition of, of marriage and proper sexuality is between a male and a female in the marriage context. And, and so that's where my heart hurts. It, it's not outside the church. And by all means, outside the church, we need to be in relationship. We need to be loving. We need to be supportive in those kinds of ways. Because at the end of the day, we've all got something that God is leading us closer to him through. And maybe that's that something that God is going to use in some way, shape, or form to lead sinners to a Savior. Paul's got that in his experience, right? He's the persecutor of the church that changed church planter at an encounter with Christ. Why? Because God sent a Christian in his life. He had an encounter with Jesus on a road, and what's God do? He sends some other guy, says, go talk to Paul. Because I'm doing something in Paul's life, so I've put you in his life for this reason to point Paul further closer to me. And Paul had that experience then because someone was placed in his life who was a believer that could point him further the next steps in faith in Christ. And so we need to be that kind of a people too for when God opens our eyes in some different way, when God encounters us in some way, shape, or form through time. And, and it's up to God to do that convicting, right? We, we can't work on people's hearts. We just don't have that power, but, but God does, and so we're present for when God might be moving and stirring in some way, shape, or form in those circumstances at hand. Third point that I would say from, from this discussion of sexuality, we as a church need to celebrate sexuality and celibacy. Sexuality and celibacy itself. Paul would put it this way, To the unmarried and widows, I say that it's well for them to remain single as I do. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn a flame with passion. And, and he's outlining back and forth in chapter 7 some instructions in sexuality in the marriage bed and some instructions in abstinence and celibacy and, and singleness there. It's a both and. There is two proper grounds for human sexuality according to this user manual for life. And that is sexuality in a marriage bed between a male and a female and celibacy and abstinence and it's that part that that we don't celebrate enough in, in this church or in churches in general and i'm pointing the fingers at myself there right we love it in those moments that we get to plaster a picture of a newborn baby and to celebrate that life and that is good and that is a rightful place we should do that but where we've dropped the buck is is in celebrating singleness and celibacy as well because it's not a second rate status in god's sight did you hear that celibacy, singleness, that is not second-rate status in the church or in God's kingdom. That is a good and rightful expression of sexuality, the singleness and the celibacy of it. And God affirms that. Think of this book. Think of the Hebrews that it, the heroes that it prizes through this book. People in the Old Testament like Daniel, many think that he was a eunuch. That is someone who works in the palace that was actually taken from, their sexuality was taken from them. They were castrated. A male's castrated to work in the palace setting. Many think Daniel was that kind of figure in Babylon. We certainly know in the New Testament, the Ethiopian eunuch was in that classification. Think about Jesus, right? Jesus isn't just our Messiah, he's our model. That means he shows us what human life looks like. And think of this, Jesus never had the, 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 the privileges of orgasm. He, he never had an encounter with a male or a female in that kind of way. He, he was celibate for all of his duration of life. And he's not second rate in any means, right? This is the son of God, an expression of sexuality and singleness that is celibacy. And even Paul himself, he writes, remain single as I do. Uh, apparently Paul is encouraging this way of life, not like he's begrudging it, not like he's sorry he didn't have a spouse. No, he's encouraging the Corinthians that there is some benefit to this way of life of what God's doing in you, to you, and through you by this calling of celibacy. And so how do we celebrate both sexuality in the marriage context and singleness and celibacy is, is the challenge of the church and maybe where we've lost the debate as a church and why we have some other debates. I, I think one of the reasons is because we've lost the context of friendship, Right? We've made friendship, at least in the popular culture there, is, oh, you hear the phrase, I married my best friend. And so we've merged best friend and marriage together, and that's the popular idiom there uh, of Hollywood's love stories there, marrying your best friend in that way. 
And so we think of a friendship, something that you have to be intimate with in some way, shape, or form. And that's not the biblical picture, right? There's a genuine sense that you can be friends with someone without being in bed with someone. And yet we've lost that language as a church because maybe we've lost it as a culture. We think to be friends with someone, you've got to be all in, at least an intimate friend with someone. Hey, you've got to be all in in some kind of way, shape, or form. And that's not the biblical picture. We're getting that script from somewhere else. Not, not from Scripture. How do we celebrate friendship that, that doesn't have to have the strings of a sexual encounter attached to it, but just good, genuine friendship, guy to guy, female to female, that wouldn't involve some sexual friendship in that way? We need to find a way to do that as a church and as the language of the church. Lastly, too, what we need to hear on summarizing sexuality, we need to hear a word about sexuality and second chances. Sexuality and second chances. Our text from last week, right? Do you not know that unrighteous will inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the immoral, the adulterers, the idolaters, the sexual perverts, thieves, the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. What's Paul saying? That, that's your past. Paul knows the people. He knows their past. He knows himself. He knows his past in that way. And some of those pasts were filled in on those blanks. Were, though, past tense, right? He goes on to say this, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. You need to know something that doesn't clear in the English, but is clear in the Greek. That first were, when, where Paul says, such were some of you, that's the imperfect tense of the verb to be. It has to do with past acts. Those next words, that is not the imperfect tense. That is a new tense of what God continues to do in the lives of believers. Cleansing them, sanctifying them, washing them. There's a distinction. Paul is saying you've got a second chance because of what Jesus has done for you and what the Spirit is birthing, regenerating within you. You focus on Jesus and you keep growing closer to Jesus. Like I said before, life does not have a rewind button. But it does have a redemption button, and his name is Jesus and what he did on the cross. And that does mean we have to call a sin a sin. But it does mean in calling a sin a sin that there is a Savior who came to take away the sins of the world. Did you hear that? That's the Christmas announcement. That's taken from the angels to the shepherds, right? There's a Savior that's been born to you, Christ the Lord. He takes away the sins of the world. And so we can't lose the message of sin in the church because we lose the message of sin in the church. We've lost our reason for salvation. We've lost Jesus and what God has done in this daring rescue plan, leaving heaven to come to earth to die our death on the cross. We got to call a sin what it is. But in the understanding of what it is, it makes what he has done all the more beautiful and loving and caring. It should lead us even closer to him. So I said last week, and I'll remain true to it this week, and that is I've wanted to close these sermons with a true story taken from Scripture that has to do with someone in sexual brokenness. Last week we talked about Rahab, right? First we were introduced to her as the prostitute, and God pushes the redemption button in her life, and she becomes the mother, the great-great-great-great-great-grandmother, I should say, of Jesus, right? He changes her life from sexual promiscuity to settling with a man that becomes a part of Jesus' family tree. He pushed the redemption button in her life. I was going to close with the story of the Samaritan woman in the well. John chapter 4. As of last night, I was still going to close with that. Changed it in, in, in that kind of way. But you know that conversation, right? Jesus is thirsty. He's sitting at a well. A woman comes to draw water at the well. And, and Jesus starts conversing with her about sexuality, right? No! First, he talks with her about water, right? Small subjects, building relationship. We don't dive into that from the start. Much the same way of what we were talking in point two. He's thirsty. She's coming to draw water. They talk water because water's right there, right? It's a natural lead-in. But in the conversing of that relationship, in the course of time, Jesus says, go and call your husband. And she says, I don't have one. And Jesus calls her out on it, right? You're right. You don't have one husband, you've had five husbands. And the man you're currently living with isn't your husband. Jesus, what are you doing, right? Why are you going there? Just, just talk nice matters, just stick with the water, right? But Jesus doesn't just stick with the, the sugar and spice and everything nice. 
to understand the Savior that he's wanting to work in our life, sometimes he's got to go to the tough points, and he does that in her life and experience in the course of changing her life. I don't, I don't want to close with that story. I want to close with this story, okay? <laughs> See how I snuck that one in there? Thank you for that. La- <laughs> the go-to story that, that we have talked about before in this, I think, is John chapter 8. Whenever we're dealing with matters of human sexuality and specifically sexual brokenness, I think we've got to go back to John chapter 8. And as a matter of fact, in our small group discussions, that's one of the questions to reflect on is John chapter 8. In, in the midst of that story, Jesus is at church. He's teaching, he's in the synagogue, the the, the temple itself, and he's teaching the crowds. And and in some shack somewhere in Jerusalem is a lady shacking up with a man that aren't married. They're outside God's good bounds of a sexual relationship there. Two unmarried people going at it when the woman is taken from that setting, not the man. It shows you this was a setup job, right? They were just trying to set her up for failure, and the guy was given free release. Whatever the case, they drag her to church, the temple, and lay her right before Jesus as a test to Jesus, right? And so Jesus has got to address sexuality at church. Imagine that. Uh, they're asking him about her, and they say to Jesus, what, what should we do with her? The law says stone her. What do you say, Jesus, as a test for Jesus? Remember what Jesus does? He dodges it, right? He just goes drawing in the, the dirt for the longest time to the point where the people are like, I know you're just trying to dodge it, Jesus but what are we going to do with her? And so Jesus stands up and says, he who's without the first sin cast the first stone, right? And then he goes back to his real work, drawing in the sand, whatever he was writing, whatever he was drawing in that way. But the target hit their mark, right? Because people had to deal not just with sin in her, but sin in them. And there was a savior for all that sin, right? But they had to look in within, not not look without in that way. And so they start dropping their rocks and they're starting about thinking about themselves, reflecting about their own sin as they walk away. And then you know what Jesus does? He doesn't dodge the issue right at his feet. He stands up and he looks the woman in her eye. And, and I imagine that woman probably hadn't had someone look her in the eye for quite some time. And certainly not the way like Jesus does, right? Someone who genuinely loves her looks deep into her eyes and not her curves or what he can get from her, but just cares for her. He looks her in the eye, and this is what he says in this one-on-one relationship. This is what Jesus says to her in this way in John chapter 8. He says, Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. See, some of us think the story ends with people dropping their rocks and, and that being it, right? The story doesn't end there. It ends with a conversation between Jesus. And then some of us think the story ends with neither do I condemn you and and just live and let be in that kind of a way. And the story doesn't end there either, right? Jesus says, I don't condemn you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to the cross for you and for them that dropped their stones just a moment ago. I've gone to the cross for all this. It's not condemnation. It's the cross. It's the realization that there is a Savior for humanity's sin, whatever that sin is. We got to hear that. But then we got to hear that final punchline too. Go now and leave your life of sin. What you've been doing is not okay. What you've been doing is not in the good bounds and parameters of God's design for your life. You're wrecking your life. You're wrecking others' lives by this consequence of sin. Leave it. And, and I'm sure he's saying all this as he's looking deeply into her eyes. Because maybe she's thinking that this sin is just too big, I can't do it. She's got to look to the eyes of Jesus. Because it's in Jesus' eyes and following Jesus that there is power to kill sin in the life. doesn't happen instantaneous. It happens over time, step by step, right? Jesus calls it new birth. We talked about it last week. And so we got to learn how to walk and how to follow Jesus. But the eyes that we're called to look at are the eyes that we're called to follow that will lead us out of whatever that sin is. He's leading us places for all of eternity. If we would just keep our eyes fixated on his eyes and not what other people are doing or what other people are saying or the standards they're living by, but look to him. That's where the secret of life is found is looking to our Lord who's paid for our sin and is pale drazing the path forward to lead and follow in succession to him. That's what we need to hear about matters of human sexuality.
I imagine if you've come back-to-back weeks for 40, 50, 60-plus hour sermons, that, that there's something in that paradigm that either gets conjured up in us there or we know someone in that kind of a way. And what's the words for us? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. There really is good news, and it's found in him. But it's only found in him. Not in the debates, not in anything else that we can get caught up in, but looking to him and listening for the delicate places he puts his fingers on, because he did that in the Samaritan's woman. He's doing that yet again to this woman caught in the adultery. He will put his finger on touchy places. But it's not for the sake of hurt. It's for the sake of healing. And so let's let the Savior do his work. Amen? Let's be in an attitude of prayer. Lord, we don't know all the ins and outs of this intimate area but we believe you when you say you're all-knowing. And so you know how we're designed. You know what our past experiences have been. And yet, in all of that, you've called us to live looking to Jesus, a Savior and Lord for whatever situation in life we're in. And so I'm just praying that you would push that redemption button in us, Lord. Can't go backwards, but we can go forward following Jesus, and that's what we want to do. And so lead us into what that forward looks like, we pray. In Jesus' name. And his people said...